We've seen several versions of the Markov property now. Perhaps the most powerful and intuitive is the version for time homogeneous processes that was presented in lecture 38.2. That is, a Markov process is continually restarting itself at each new state that it arrives in. If X is a time homogeneous Markov process in some state space S, and if we denote by P nu, the family of probability measures P on path space, indexed by the initial probability distributions of the process at time zero, then for any initial distribution nu at time zero, the distribution of the whole process conditioned on what happens up to time t is the same as the distribution of the process starting at zero, but in whatever state xt the process got to at time t. We can phrase that in terms of testing against a measurable function on path space, as we've written right here. Now, this is stated in terms of some time t that we want to consider the process's behavior afterward, a deterministic time. But now that we're familiar with the notion of stopping times, we can ask, why not stop the process instead of at a deterministic time, at a random time that is a stopping time for the process? For example, suppose that we let a Markov process run until it hits a measurable set b. So we wait until the hitting time of b, which as we know is a stopping time. What does the process look like conditioned on that? Well, the answer is that it works exactly the same way. The Markov property holds even stopping at a random stopping time. For the time being, we're going to state and prove this in the discrete time context, and we'll return to the continuous time strong Markov property later on. So if we're in the discrete time context, and if tau is a stopping time for the filtration with respect to which our process is a Markov process, then if we take any measurable function on path space, and we consider the expectation of that function of the process shifted forward by the stopping time tau conditioned on the sigma field at time tau, then that's the same as the expected value of the function of the process starting at the beginning, but this time with its initial distribution being the random variable x at time tau. Now, the only reason why this isn't a completely accurate statement is that it might not make sense right now because tau being a stopping time could take value infinity. For example, we might try to stop a Markov process at the hitting time of some b that it actually never hits. So in order to account for that, we need to be careful and state that this holds on the event that that stopping time is finite. And then what we have here is a true theorem. Again, intuitively, what this says is that conditioned on whatever path the process followed up to the random time tau, it restarts fresh at that time in whatever state it got to at time tau. The proof is actually a pretty straightforward corollary to this deterministic time statement using the properties of stopping times. And that's because in this discrete time setting anyway, we know easily how to condition on the sigma field at the stopping time tau. That is, we would like to compute this conditional expectation here, again, on the event that tau is finite, and we know exactly how to do that. We just condition on each of the deterministic sigma fields fn in each of the events that tau is equal to n. Now we just observe that this random variable, the indicator that tau is equal to n, is fn measurable, which means by the pullout product rule for conditional expectation, we can put this inside the expectation. But of course, on the event that tau equals n, f at x tau plus blah is f at x n plus blah. And now we can do the same trick again using the pullout product rule, taking this fn measurable function out of the expectation.
Now we use the version of the Markov property stated on the last slide, which says that no matter what our starting distribution is, this conditional expectation here is exactly equal to the expectation starting at some deterministic point x of f at the process starting at time zero, and then that function of x evaluated at the process at time n. In other words, if we denote this function of x by g, then what we've shown is that this conditional expectation on the event that tau is finite is equal to the sum over all n up to but not including infinity of that function g of xn times the indicator that tau is equal to n. Well, that's exactly the definition of g of x tau except since the sum doesn't include infinity, we are zeroing out the case that tau equals infinity. But that's exactly what we wanted to show. Now remember, we had other statements of the Markov property that were useful in different contexts. For example, conditioned on the present, the past and the future are independent, and variations on that theme. So let's state one of those as a corollary to this version of the strong Markov property, again for a random stopping time. Here's one statement that we will use. Suppose that Xn is a Markov chain on a discrete state space, and let tau be a stopping time, adapted to the same filtration as the Markov process. Then, conditioned on the value at the present, that is that x tau is equal to some state x, and of course for that to make sense we need tau to be less than infinity, so we'll also condition on that. Then, everything that happened up to time tau is independent of the process after time tau. That is the sigma field f tau and the process shifted x tau plus are independent. And moreover, that shifted process x tau plus n and the original process xn have the same distribution under the probability measure px on path space. Well, to prove this, we're going to use one of the formulations of independence, which means to show that two sigma fields are independent it suffices to show that if x is any bounded random variable measurable with respect to the first sigma field and y is any bounded random variable measurable with respect to the second one, then the expectation of x times y is the expectation of x times the expectation of y. Here the expectation is going to be a conditional expectation condition on this event. So let's take y to be any bounded random variable measurable with respect to the sigma field at time tau. And then we're going to take any bounded measurable function of the process, which means, again, we're going to take any bounded path space measurable function and compose it with the process. And now we'd like to compute this conditional expectation here and show that it factors as a product. Well, I'm going to take the expectation in the event that tau is finite and x tau equals x, and then we'll divide out in the end which is perfectly valid here since we're in a discrete setting and so all of these events will have positive probability. Now let's note that this random variable here is f tau measurable. And what that means by the averaging property definition of conditional expectation is that this whole expectation can be written instead as the expectation of the conditional expectation of this on f tau times the rest of the stuff there. Now we employ the strong Markov property that we just proved on the last slide. This is equal to the expected value of f of the process started at time zero but starting at the position x tau.
But we are in the event that x tau is this fixed deterministic state x. And what that means is that this is just a scalar. It's just a number that we can now pull out of this expectation. So we see that we do get a factorization, although it doesn't quite look like the kind of factorization we were hoping for yet. We'll see that it does, in fact, work into that form. To begin with, what we've calculated here is the expected value in this event, and we'd instead like to calculate the conditional expectation conditioned on that event. So we'll just divide through by the probability of that event. Unfortunately, on both sides of the equation, we have the same event. So when we divide through, we just get the same statement, but with conditional expectations. Now let's first deal with the question of the distribution of the process after shifting by tau. And we can get to that by taking y equal to 1, which is, of course, an f tau measurable random variable. In that case, this conditional expectation here is just 1. And so all we get is that the expectation of f at the shifted process conditioned on these events here is equal to simply the expectation of f at the original process started at 0 in starting state x. Now, of course, since tau makes no appearance on this side, we could write that as the conditional expectation given this event, because this event is manifestly independent of what's going on inside here. And so we have now shown that conditioned on this event, that is relative to this conditional probability measure, this process in here has the same distribution as this process under initial starting point x. Now, moreover, taking the two equations that we have here, this one and this one, and combining them, if we, for the sake of notational convenience, denote by E prime, the conditional expectation, given the event that tau is finite and x tau equals x, then what these two here say together is that e prime of the shifted process times y is equal to e prime of the shifted process times e prime of y. That's just substituting this equation in for the value of this expectation here. Since this holds for all bounded measurable functions y measurable with respect to the sigma field f tau, it therefore follows that this process is independent from that sigma field, which concludes our proof. Now, I want to point out something that might look counterintuitive that is an immediate consequence of what we've written here. This process here starts at time zero. So what that says is that this process, which even at time zero is x tau, is independent from f tau. The tau appears on both sides, but we do have independence because we're breaking at that instant random time on both sides. So in particular, what we have is that the initial chain from x0 up to x tau and the chain starting at tau again afterward, x tau, x tau plus one and on, those two chains are independent from each other. And that's gonna be a powerful tool that will allow us to analyze the long run behavior of Markov chains.